Hello everyone, it's Steve with Aptair Owners Club. In this video, we're going to go over the Q&A section of the webinar from a few days ago and kind of analyze and break down the answers. All right, so let's watch the Q&A and then we'll have some running, running commentary on it. Um, that we have gathered from all of you out there. So we'll go ahead and, and get started and get through as many as we can in the next 20 or so minutes while we have time. So. Let's start with, I think, the question on everyone's minds regarding delivery and production timeline. So can you give us a little bit of background? When is the production intent vehicle planned for completion? Um, the engineering team is working very, very hard to basically put a pin in the production design. Um, uh, Jason alluded to showing everyone an example of the Gamma vehicle here in about a month, um, uh, maybe a few. So. Remember the production intent vehicle, the code name for it is Delta. And so they are building the Gamma vehicle now and they're gonna publicly show the Gamma vehicle in about a month. They're currently still uh, haven't finished designing the Delta vehicle. They're like very close. They're trying to put a pin in it. So they're trying to finalize it. A few weeks more to put, uh, to put some polish on it. Uh, but very soon we'll have a representative Gamma vehicle. Um, but obviously, uh, I think what people don't realize is the effort that went into building that Gamma vehicle and the design for that Gamma vehicle was months and months ago. Um, you know, same thing with Beta. I mean, we're out testing Beta now, and you saw the suspension team out there, but that vehicle was designed a year ago. Um, and then we had to build that vehicle, and now it's actually getting to testing. So it's the same thing with the uh, actual production intent vehicle, the Delta version of the vehicle. Uh, we're trying to put a pin in that uh, Delta version of the vehicle now. It will take several more months to put a pin in that, uh, but we hope to have that production uh, pre-production vehicle done by the end of the year and we hope to deliver our first pre-production vehicle okay so he's saying it's gonna be several more months before the production intent vehicle design is done so that several more months could be August or it could be September that's when the design is done that then they start building the thing uh, to somebody by the end of the year and then we hope to scale our manufacturing into 2023 uh, and i think you know as we see this building fill out with equipment and okay so i don't know if you guys missed that but basically it sounds like the first so they're gonna they're gonna probably finalize delta or the production intent vehicle august september maybe even october who knows sometime in there and then they're gonna build the thing hopefully by the end of this year and they're gonna deliver that car that's the production and the first production intent vehicle they're going to deliver it to a customer that's going to be a paradigm model and someone's going to get that car um, that production intent car is going to be a customer car so i think that's how they plan on meeting their deadline of delivering a car by this year that car will not be one of the mass produced cars it will not be come off the production line it'll be probably one that's built in their Develop, development facility, not in their factory. The other building down the street full out with equipment, I think uh, everybody uh, will kind of feel the momentum uh, that we're looking to scale in 2023 and really start to deliver volumes. I think one of the exciting things is, um, you know, when we first started, we first started, um, it was, uh, um, gosh, if we could get a thousand orders, you know, like this is, this is, you know, this could be a real company. And, uh, you know, I had my boat company and I was like, well, you know, it kind of takes like three or 4,000 before you get any kind of economies of scale. Oh, well, that'd be great. If we got three or 4,000. Well, holy shit, man. And then after like two weeks of pre-orders, we had, you know, 4,000 <laughs> orders and now we have 25,000 orders. Uh, but we saw this trend and, you know, kind of a year ago we said, okay, this is not a small production plan anymore. This is not a small time build, you know, 4,000 vehicles a year type of company. This is a, we need to plan to build a hundred thousand vehicles a year and how do we get there? So everything we're doing here in San Diego is really on the premise of how do we build 50,000 vehicles a year? And we started, you know, really working with our vendors and, you know, talking about, you know, what, what does the tooling look like to scale to that number? Uh, and I think we've been executing on that greatly. So I think people will be surprised that, uh, that even though um, it has taken uh, a bit longer to really execute on first production vehicle and, you know, even slightly scale, once we get to scale, it's going to be explosive and we're going to be able to deliver a lot of vehicles very quickly. So. And and there's, uh, there's some announcements that we haven't made yet that we will be that are really to that point of how do we transition beyond our earlier thinking to 50,000, 100,000 units a year, and who are the partners that are going to help us do that? And that's really exciting, and that's, that's what enables us. I think Pablo would attest to the amazing support we've gotten from strategic suppliers 
um, that uh, certainly two years ago would not have given us the time of day. Uh, but now that we've been able to express, you know, our solar mobility vision to people, and we have 25,000 orders, I think people, you know, out in the world, uh, the vendors, suppliers are like, yes, we want to be part of solar mobility. You guys uh, are going to make it and we're going to support you. So I think we've gotten a lot of help from strategic suppliers that, that two years ago just were unthinkable, um, you know, because they were so big uh, and had such scale. Uh, in automotive, but now we're working with them. They're investing in us. Uh, they're giving us support uh, that they aren't giving, uh, you know, other companies. I think, and you know, I, it's it's really been cool to see um, how people have been supporting solar mobility. So, it just helps us scale quicker and deliver more vehicles quicker. So, how many questions do we have? I have a long. Oh. Okay, so um, that was very interesting because initially they were thinking a few thousand vehicles would be good. And that's the kind of the production ramp they were thinking. And now that they have 25,000 orders, suppliers that get, didn't talk to them because they thought they were too small time are very interested in them. I think they all realize that once they actually go into production, uh, the order numbers, this 25,000 um, orders will seem like nothing. Their, their order numbers are going to ramp up tremendously. Because right now, I think there's a lot of people interested, but so many electric car companies never deliver a production car. So people are waiting on the sidelines to see, is Aptera going to actually deliver a car? So they think, I think they realize that with, if there's 25,000 people that are so as interested when they haven't even delivered a production car, once these things start hitting the streets, and you know, most people out in the public have no idea that Aptera even exists. So once they see one, they're going to wonder what it is and they're going to find out about it. And word of mouth on Aptera is going to be incredible. Um, so they are now changing the way that they think about how much production they're going to make. And this is what uh, Chris told me when I went and visited them, that they've realized that they need to ramp much faster. And they're talking to their suppliers and saying, you know, you don't, you can't give us 5,000 of these things. You got to give us like 20,000 of these things or 10,000 of these things, like larger batches. So now they can deal with bigger suppliers. Um, so um, it's good to see that they think that their production ramp is going to be very fast. I mean, they're mm -hmm. talking about 100,000 units a year. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But um, perhaps their micro factory thing makes it so that they can open up more factories soon and run these in parallel. But anyway, that's very exciting that, um, that they're planning on doing that. But as you can see, the first few vehicles are going to be um, built not by their factory, but at their development facility. And they will be using probably the prototype um, parts that their suppliers are sending them, not the large volume parts. They're gonna be like, these are the, these are the, this is the production intent part. Let's see how this works out. And it's probably gonna not, probably gonna stay the same, but it won't be the large batches. Like Alafe is gonna make them the motors uh, in small batches and give it to them. And then, you know, their motor factory is not going to ramp up until sometime in 2023. That's when they start getting large batches of those motors. Okay. List of questions. <laughs> that's, your problem. that's probably, that's, a, that's so one that's I think that's on everyone. That, that's minds. a big one. Okay, that's a big one. Um, but just, I guess, one quick follow-up question to that. So as far as regional rollout, do we have any idea or vision on how that regional rollout will happen? Will it be California? Do we have a plan for other states beyond Yeah, you know, what's, what's in our head now, I think um, everyone will share the sentiment, is, you know, the first thousand vehicle deliveries uh, should probably be as consistent as possible. Uh, so we're obviously building the, the 41 uh, kilowatt hour pack first you know the first in our heads first thousand vehicles will be that vehicle um, and obviously we don't want to ship them all around the world uh, right away we want to ship them close to home so we can support uh, those customers so kind of in our head is the first thousand vehicles you know stay close to home but okay so that's a very but our important point is that it sounds like the first thousand vehicles and my guess is that this first thousand vehicles is going to be best case scenario this is just me guessing uh, best case scenario is going to take, like, let's say they stay start on time. They deliver this production and then vehicle to the first customer at the end of this year. They start doing their ramp up in 2023. The first thousand vehicles, I'm guessing, is going to take well into summer of 2023. So well into summer of 23, you're probably going to have to be in California or Arizona, maybe Vegas, somewhere within reasonable driving distance of San Diego. And it's going to have to be the front wheel drive. 40 kilowatt hour uh, car. 
our ramp is very aggressive. So it's not like delivering those first thousand vehicles takes, you know, six months. Um, it's in a couple months we have those first thousand vehicles out the door. So that's what they're saying is they're going to be a few months. I think it's going to be into the summer of 2023. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, my guess is the production ramp is not going to start until the spring. And then we can spread, you know, from California out to the rest of the U.S. and then out to the world. Uh, so we think that by 2024, you know, we'll kind of be a global company and, you know, be delivering vehicles all over the place. Mm -hmm. Remember, uh, when company founders talk, they're talking very optimistically. So optimistically, we're going to, they're going to start doing, they're going to get to the rest of the United States by the end of 2023. And in sometime in 2024, we're going to start having international deliveries. My guess is international deliveries means Canada and Mexico. That's great. Um, so for those people who are contemplating changing their orders, perhaps and wondering whether they would get their Aptera sooner if they changed to... If you change to a 41 kilowatt hour version of the Aptera, you'll probably get your vehicle yeah. quicker. Uh, but we certainly understand, you know, the need to move from the 400 mile range version to the to the 250 and 600 as quickly as possible because, um, you know, a lot of people want uh, those different range options. But the 400 is our most popular vehicle variant. I think 40% of our orders are just the 400 uh, or 400 mile range version. So that was some good information. 40% are the 40 kilowatt version, which makes a little sense. I mean, that's the one I ordered. And I think that's the battery pack that makes the most sense for the most people. Um, you know, yes, if, if you want yours quicker, you'll still hold your place in line. Even if you change your order, we still will rank you by when you put your order in. So, uh, so don't fear if you change, you know, your, your vehicle variant. Uh, we'll... So, so if you change, it doesn't like, you don't have to go back to the back of the line. You keep your pay place in line if you change order. So if you do want it faster, change it to the front wheel drive 40 kilowatt version. They'll get you, you know, your vehicle in the order that you placed your pre-order the best right. we can. <laughs> Thank you. We have lots of questions regarding financing and investing. Um, can you give us a quick overview? Are we still taking investments from the public? Um, and can we invest in the Series B round? How is Marathon involved in this? Maybe you could give us a quick overview of our current situation as it relates to fundraising. Uh, it's been amazing to see the amount of crowd. I'll try to make it quick. It's <laughs> yeah, been amazing okay. to see the amount of crowdfunding, uh, crowdfunding uh, support we've gotten. We have over 11,000 investors, uh, and they continue um, you know, uh, to come in every time we open up uh, that round. Uh, we, have, uh, we have closed uh, the crowdfunding uh, round now, uh, but if you are an accredited investor or, and are interested in a private preferred uh, round of investing, uh, you know, please, please contact us. Uh, if you're an accredited investor, you know what uh, accredited means. Uh, but we are still uh, running that accredited investor round for the next uh, few weeks. Um, so accredited investor means that you have a net worth of over, I think, two million and or an annual income of greater than two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And we signed a, a deal with uh, Marathon Capital, the nation's largest uh, clean tech investment bank, um, and they will be uh, shepherding the capital uh, that we need to, you know, move, um, you know, not only into production but beyond production uh, into other variants of the vehicle and opening up new factories. And it's exciting to see the financial model come together and see, you know, we have a financial model to open up six factories in the next several years. Um, so each of those uh, factories obviously comes with capital needs, um, and uh, it's been amazing that uh, the public has been so gracious to support us with those capital needs so far. Uh, but these are you know pretty big dollars we're talking about. Uh, so Marathon Capital is coming in to talk to institutional investors, and obviously getting those institutional investors involved uh, you know helps us uh, scale very quickly. And then obviously we're looking to be a public entity, uh, you know, within the next uh, you know couple of years. So I think uh, Marathon plays uh, plays well into that plan uh, and positions us uh, positions us well to be. A Public, com public company. Great. Okay, so they are, I mean, we have had several videos on this channel about how the capital markets are getting really tight. And, uh, you know, obviously we've seen the stock market is not doing well. And uh, many, like Sequoia Capital, a lot of the startup uh, hedge fund people and venture capital firms are saying that capital is going to be tight. Now, Chris sounds very confident. Uh, he doesn't look worried about capital, so maybe he knows things that we don't know. And maybe uh, a lot of investors are seeing Aptera, they're making good strides and they feel like it's a good bet. Um, I hope that's the case. And uh, an interesting thing is he's saying that they're, the in institutional investors are, try are thinking about getting in um, through uh, uh, Marathon Capital. 
So institutional investors are like college pen, um, you know, college endowment funds, pension funds. These large, you know, these these uh, institutional investors control, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars um, each. So uh, they, you know, a few million dollars to them is kind of uh, less than a percentage point of their portfolio. So maybe they're willing. They they think that this is a good bet. I hope that's the case, and and that'll help if they if they really think that they can raise the amount of capital to run. To open up six new factories in the next couple of years, um, that will increase their production ramp significantly. Great. So stay tuned for more information on that coming soon. We have a question from a customer who pre-ordered the thousand mile version and lives in the Netherlands, Europe. So mm -hmm. they're wondering, um, they understand they'll be expecting their Aptera later. They are wondering, will there be more options? Um, for example, cooled seats, heat pump seating because of the additional development time. And mm -hmm. what do you anticipate that timing might look like? Well, you can speak to timing on the technical yeah, part. Sure. Uh, heat pump is something that we're obviously very interested in. We're not launching with it, mm -hmm. uh, but definitely it's a more efficient way to heat and cool the vehicle. Uh, heated seats have been not only discussed, but there's a placeholder for them. Um, I don't know if they will make it into the launch vehicle. So I think by time we go through EU homologation, uh, those, those things would be available in that model. Okay, so heat pump, definitely not happening. Heat, heated seats, maybe not happening. And, and, and like the way they're talking about probably not happening is, is more like it. So um, I think what they're doing is they're cutting features or reducing features to try to deliver faster. Um, but they're trying to get the core things correct. The core engineering, the core uh, reliability is gonna be correct. But features like heated seats and heat pumps, those are gonna be kind of put in the back burner. Yeah, I, I would add that we are very conscious of the uh, homologation needs for the EU and, and our customers, our future customers there. Um, and we're, we're addressing that on, on both the physical side and the regulatory, like lighting side and everything. But we're, we're very aware of, of those needs and how they, how they need to be met. I'm looking at the map behind you, Sarah, and I'm trying to discern a thousand miles from the Netherlands it's very very far <laughs> like you could drive to spain maybe yeah. like it's yeah. a thousand like miles is a yeah. lot of range like um so it'll be very cool to see those those vehicles out yeah. there and see what people can actually I wanna do know with where they plan on driving with that thing yeah, yeah. so i guess a follow-up range related question so as you can tell uh i think the thousand mile uh vehicle is gonna be it is is they definitely said it's the last vehicle they're gonna make and you can tell that both steve and chris don't see um, very many people needing that kind of range or they don't see the use case scenario very um, uh, very clearly and uh, I think it is it is a halo vehicle it's like a good marketing vehicle to say that they have a thousand mile vehicle but they're 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 both thinking like who the heck is going to drive a thousand miles question um, related to the all-wheel drive and the front wheel drive how many miles less of range does the all do, does the all-wheel drive have versus I, I can't really say yeah, yeah. okay yeah. We, we haven't really put okay. a number that's on it okay. yet but we'll be testing that's fair over the coming months. that's fair um have all of the street legal hurdles such as the rear facing camera has been overcome yes yes okay. without a doubt great the answer is yes they th they're also thanking you for your hard work. So there you go. <laughs> thank you. Um, let's see. What can you tell us on the level two autonomy plan for Aptera at this point? Uh, it's progressing nicely, but it really is lining up uh, the vendors to uh, to support us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about level two autonomy, you have to control the steering system, the braking mm -hmm. system. Uh, you have to have a brilliant uh, sensor package uh, to get you where you need to go. But uh, the space is changing really, really quickly. I mean, we first started talking about level two autonomy, you know, a couple of years ago. And just in the last two years, I think, uh, you know, the ideas that a lot of the vendors have had have really changed. So we're, we're thinking very differently now about what that uh, package looks like and I think in large part it's been drastically simplified it's a lot cheaper now um, mm -hmm. so I think we we will be able to offer that um, you know eventually but we're not looking to offer that in the in the first production vehicles where we're, we're, we're slowly progressing into um, a system we can validate that validation will take some time um, and then we'll be able to offer it uh, to you guys as an add-on so they're not offering in the initial run level two autonomy will not be offered um, interestingly I will say that one of their new marketing guys, Chris McCammon, came from uh, Kama AI, 
Uh, so that that's a self-driving company. So uh, they are definitely aware of that company. And I think a lot of people are looking at that company and thinking that that should be the level two uh, supplier for Aptera. I'm sure that that's one of the vendors that they're looking at. Um, and remember, there was the uh, the large uh, EV group started by Foxconn that uh, that Aptera joined, and and they have a couple of uh, self-driving car companies in as part of that group. And I'm sure that's uh, part of the level two that they're looking into as well. Um, I don't know if they're going to preemptively put in the sensors that are necessary for self-driving. Um, in the initial production run and then offer the level two as an over the air update, or they're just not even gonna put the sensors in. And so the, the initial run of cars will just will not ever have that capability as, um, as, as, a, as a stock thing. Like maybe you could add a Biacom AI device and put it on later, but it won't be a part of the core thing. So I'm not sure which way, how they're gonna handle that. Great. We have a lot of design related questions. So Jason, I'm gonna turn it over to you here. Um, okay. Let's talk about a question that's um, been a, a hot topic on our forums and on our social media regarding the yoke. Oh. Can you give us some more <laughs> details on the benefits of the yoke? Sure. Okay, so the yoke is a hot topic, very, very controversial. Some people are like, are very against the yoke and they're like, that's a deal breaker. And some people are like, eh, Yoke's probably fine, and some people love the yoke. What is its I, functional I you were purpose? I thought talk about cup holders. Well, that's on, next on my list. <laughs> is that next? <laughs> that's, that's next. usually the hot topic. That's the, that's the second hot topic. Okay. But. So uh, in our development, we've, we've got to a place where we really wanted to combine the vision system, and not only that, the driving dynamics and everything. It just, again, the, the, the experience of Aptera, all of it, from the, from the visual to the physical, kind of demands that we we are part of the future and the future in this case for us is involving a yoke uh, steering mechanism or steering wheel um, I think the benefits so far uh, which we're optimizing for are the ergonomics both in the hand feel and also for the uh, again really the vision system and it there's an adoption there's definitely an experience and you but once you're kind of doing this you've quickly realized like this makes sense, and and you you kind of jettison any any kind of either baggage or old way of thinking or kind of you. I'm, I was so used to this, and I didn't know that that would work also. So we look forward to sharing that um, in person. You'll see that in our in our uh, show vehicle next month, in our Gamma, and uh, I think we'll we'll have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, great support on that. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right, about. Okay, so sounds like the yoke is definitely happening, and it sounds like you you don't have a choice on the yoke. They 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 didn't mention anything about a wheel option, uh, and I think adding more options just delays production. So I, I kind of agree with like having as few options as possible. You know the the Sono Scion they they only have one color. It's one vehicle. There's no options on that car which um, Aptera gives you some options in terms of like batteries and all-wheel drive and, and the number of solar panels you get, but less options makes production easier. And so they're making the yoke, that's, they're going with that. And a lot of people feel like it's unsafe because, you know, emergency maneuvers, you're not, you might grab air if, you, if you're used, not used to the yoke. I'm not too sure how I feel about it. I've never driven a yoke vehicle other than go-karts at a, at a kart racing place. It felt fine. Um, I, I, I am personally ambivalent to it. I think a yoke will be fine. I think a wheel will be fine. Um, I don't really care, but I know that some people feel very strongly about it, but whatever, whatever your feelings are, the Aptera is coming with a yoke. That's, that's pretty clear. About these cup holders. Yes. Cup holders <laughs> are huge. Can yes. you explain how will the bungee style cup holders work? Will yes. it be removable for cleaning? Yes, um, we have several ways, and this, this speaks to kind of the modularity of what we want to offer the users. Uh, we always, from the first second, knew that there are certain things that the vehicle will, will have. You know, the comfort, the safety, the cup holders, um, some storage, you know, as, as, as efficiently as we can provide the storage. The, the current module that we're, we're going to test out, or sorry, that, we're gonna, that we have tested out and we're going to put in the show vehicle is um, we're adding the bungees as a kind of extra feature so that they don't tip over. Now we could make them taller and deeper, but that's more material. 
So we're trying to use the least amount of material. material and there's a, the, the actual bungee is in a, it's not a natural fiber, but it's, a, it's like a recycle. It's got a great story too. So what these bungees do when you put the modules in, your cups or your bottles, is they just secure it. So it doesn't go flying around. And, and you know, given our driving dynamics, this is important. So cup holders have always been part of it. You know, we, we take it from a first, a first person point of view. Like, what do I need? What do I need is the most important. What do I want is where we get to have a lot of flexibility and a lot of fun. And then how we do that. How do we efficiently offer the manufacturing? You know, I don't think anybody's expecting, and, and I'm allergic to a giant plastic center council. That's not going to happen. But we're going to give some great materials. We're going to have the comfort. Your arm will be there. You have some storage. Um, we have a document holder. Um, we have an overhead council with, uh, you know, we used to call them map lights, but that maps aren't a thing. Paper maps aren't a thing anymore. <laughs> so we have cabin lights, right? Um, and then as you move to the screen, you've got all the interaction for your HMI and your, your UI UX and your vehicle controls. Um, we're going to hold back. There's, there's something, somebody will kind of figure it out, but we're going to hold back on until the show vehicle on, on what we're really, the innovation that we're bringing to the cabin. So okay. next question. That's probably a Okay, so uh, th it's very interesting. They're going to have some kind of modular thing that you can put into that center console and have it have different functions. I think that's a great idea. I've never even thought of it, but I'm very interested to see how that works. And since they're going to have this gamma vehicle um, ready in about a month, I definitely plan. So I, I, I told the team that I hope to come back down when they had a production intent vehicle and I guess a gamma vehicle is close to a production intent vehicle so I definitely want to go check that out in person so I will be reaching out to them hopefully they'll let me come down and you know film it for you guys and get maybe get a ride or a test drive even um, anyways we'll see how that goes um, I will now be making a plan to be down there in about a month month and a half um, whenever that vehicle is ready but yeah this modular cup holder thing sounds amazing follow up maybe alluding to that but um this is this customer is a big guy six three <laughs> and 250 pounds will he be comfortable in this vehicle for long drives i hope so i, I don't know him but i would hope that he would be <laughs> we're, we're going to give him a great environment like okay there's a balance between optimization but also um how should i say this optimization of like a perfect world or optimization for the world's most efficient vehicle. Mm -hmm. We have a comfortable seat in the right position. We have a larger cabin. We have the reach envelopes, but it's not a minivan. There is no sense of large space. It is it is a controlled or not a confined. It's it's an environment that is commensurate with the mission, which is the most efficient vehicle possible. Um, we've done well beyond the Alpha seat. So anybody that's an, experienced an actual Alpha seat. Um, they're going to be very pleased with where we're at with the, with the uh, gamma interior. Yeah, I always think it's funny when people ask, like, am I going to be comfortable in the car? I mean, seat comfort is so subjective. What may be comfortable for one person may be not comfortable for another person. Um, so I think that's a people are just going to have to sit down and find out if it's comfortable for them. Uh, fortunately for me, I have very few problems with uh, any of the seats. I thought the Alpha vehicle seats were, were plenty comfortable. Um, I've gone on long road trips in all sorts of cars. I've never had problems with any of the seats. Um, so I'm probably not the best judge of, of how comfortable a seat is for a, for a particular person. But uh, it sounds, you know, they've made the cabin bigger, uh, like lower. And um, they're designing it for, I think, a 6'7 or a 6'8 person. Um, but, it, you know, it is, a, it is a relatively small cabin, as uh, Jason Hill was gently trying to say it. Uh, it's not expansive. So if you, if you need a large space and if you need a really plushy seat, um, then I don't think that is going to have a super plushy seat. It's, it's going to be, um, it's, it's going to have to be light. So the padding on it is going to be not as much as, you know, like they have in a the Ford F-150 or a, a big minivan like he was talking about. And we have uh, employees here that are pretty tall, and you just went to Electrify Expo and had some pretty tall people in the vehicle yeah. and uh, seemed to be very comfortable even for the 6'5 plus guys. Yeah, and that's alpha. Right, so yeah. once we're in the gamma <clears throat> tier, that's a whole nother level. So how will yeah. gamma change? Well, it's, it's just bigger and better, right? And it, it's enough, 
you think, oh, those look exactly the same. They're the same size, but they're not. Because when you're in such a space like this, every little millimeter counts, and we're optimizing for all of that space, space efficiency. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it just, to me, Jason Hill strikes me as a very thoughtful guy. And uh, I love his design, and I think I, I just trust him as a designer. That's great. Okay, we have just a couple more minutes left for questions. Um, I guess moving away, so could we talk about um, service and support? Will we be setting up regional support and service centers? Um, what And uh, what type of a warranty do you anticipate for the final production model? Do we have any more information? Uh, we'll we'll be announcing uh, warranty specs as we get closer to a production. Uh, it really uh, leans on our uh, supply chain. Um, obviously, a lot of the warranty stuff is passed through, so we kind of have to completely lock our bill of materials and all the supply agreements to finalize uh, our warranty program. Uh, but we'll be announcing that closer to production. And our service and support, I think, you know, we, we, we're building a very modular uh, vehicle that uh, that should be very easy to repair, uh, but we realize, you know, things happen. So not just being, um, you know, right to repair company uh, that can provide you information, parts, uh, and support, uh, but having, uh, you know, regional service centers and kind of our mobile service uh, will be important uh, over time. Uh, obviously, we can tell where our order densities are, and, you know, we'll basically place those uh, service centers and support uh, services uh, where, where our highest orders are. Yeah, and there's there parts of that plan are coming together. Uh, and some decisions to be made still, on whether they're maybe trained, vetted, credentialed partners, or whether it's Aptera run, and mm -hmm. we're we're working through both of those things. Yeah. Great. Any okay, so they're definitely, you know, it's on their radar. They they haven't finalized a plan of whether they're gonna like, you know, I don't know, contract with Pep Boys or whatever, or have uh, some mobile person that goes by, goes through and uh, and does the service. But most of the people that are initially going to get Aptera are very interested in Aptera because of the right to repair. I am certainly. And one of the things that I really hope to do on this channel is to have a library of like repair videos on how to repair parts of the Aptera. Um, so the, uh, and I, maybe Aptera themselves will have a, a library as well. Any plans for test drives? Uh, of, of course, um, as we get, you know, those kind of pre-production vehicles built. Uh, but as I said, we're we're striving to deliver our first pre-production vehicle by the end of the year. So that means we probably won't have multiple of those pre-production vehicles until 2023. So in 2023, I would say, yes, we're going to have events, uh, not only at this beautiful factory we have here, but around Southern California and maybe uh, out into the country um, as we start to, uh, to start to grow our distribution into other areas. Yeah. And I think another thing is that the whole ambassador program, I'm sure some ambassadors would be um, happy to give people rides or maybe even let them drive their cars. Um, and then the referral program comes into play because then, you know, hopefully the person who test drives an ambassador's car will, will order through the uh, referral link and things like that. And that'll reward the ambassadors for, you know, offering test drives in their own personal vehicle. I, I think that that's the thought process that Aptera is going through. I think that test ties right into the last question we had here, which was, "Will uh, when will you have solar mobility tours outside of California? So this person probably saw we went up and down the coast um, a few weeks ago and talked to college students and wondering when they'll be able to, to see Aptera. Um, I guess I can answer that from a marketing standpoint. We absolutely do um, hope to have these types of events outside of California. We're really excited to give everyone the chance to see an Aptera, sit in an Aptera, experience, you know, the movement that we're all a part of. So we'll definitely keep you posted as we have more of those events coming up, up ahead. Um, and I think that's about it. Looks like we're just um, kind of closing in on the last minute or two. Is there anything else that you guys would like to add um, before we, we close here as um, our one hour is up? Go ahead. Oh, I mean, we just broke through 25,000 uh, pre-orders while here doing this, uh, this interview. So thank you all for your support. Really appreciate it. It means a lot to us. Yeah, thank you. thanks to everyone who supported us uh, through the crowdfunding, through uh, pre-ordering the vehicle, through uh, liking our social media and helping us spread the word. Uh, our ambassador team has been uh, amazing at uh, helping with community events and spreading the, uh, the gospel uh, about solar mobility. Uh, and our team here who's uh, just putting in countless hours, you know, late nights uh, on the weekend to bring this uh, pre-production design into reality uh, and force uh, solar mobility into existence. So uh, it's been amazing to see, you know, the collaboration with a lot of young engineers 
engineers and old engineers and uh, you know strategic suppliers and vendors and you know there's just a lot of moving pieces to bring a program like this together and uh, you know I would say a couple of months ago it started to feel really tangible where as you know six months ago it felt kind of abstract because there was so many pieces moving but a couple of months ago it was like this is this is a vehicle. This yeah. all the parts are here. You know, this is you know there's there's you know the, the the steering wheel and the brake pedals and the stuff to keep you cool in the in the vehicle and the headlights. Like all, all the pieces are there. We just gotta you know uh, put a pin in it and uh, and get this vehicle ready for production. So um, it's amazing to see the progress, and we're just so humbled for the internal support and external support that we've received. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. I think um, uh, you you made the right statement about the. Um, we made a couple of key decisions, which kind of breaks the cycle of, of being able to finish. And I, I'm really, really excited about that. I will mention one more thing. We, of course, will have a windshield wiper. Because <laughs> right? that, that sometimes people are like, well, where's the wiper? But no, we have a windshield wiper, and it'll, it'll be part of our system. So um, with that, Sarah, anything else? That, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Again, we appreciate you all. We are grateful that you're a part of our journey and helping us to drive solar mobility forward. We've got lots of great stuff coming up ahead. As you can tell, it's a very exciting time for us here at Aptera. We look forward to showing you our Gamma vehicle in person very soon and sharing a lot of other announcements with you. So thanks for tuning in. More to come. Take care. Okay, so unfortunately they didn't answer my question about the cooling uh, system on a hot day, fast charging on black pavement. Uh, that's something that I didn't think to ask when I was down there. Uh, so if I get a chance to go down there, I'll definitely ask that question. Um, but that was a great question and answer session. Um, I wish they would have gotten more into the technical details. Um, but I, I think that they're trying to... Uh, give information in little spurts so that uh, they have content to kind of keep people interested over the next several months as they reach production, which makes perfect sense from a marketing standpoint. Um, they did give us a ton of information on this webinar, so it's probably more information than they've, than they've ever given all at once. So I can't complain about the amount of information they gave us. So uh, thanks a lot, guys, for watching. Um, any comments below about what you think about um, their answers, or if maybe you disagree on my interpretation of their answers. Um, let me know. Thanks for watching. And of course, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors that make this channel possible. And all of um, you guys, the viewers, and remember, I just read all your comments and really enjoy them. Uh, thanks for watching. Have a great day, everyone.